So I'm Laura Marie, and it's May 18th of 2023. I am in Eugene, Oregon, in Kalapuya land. And I uh, want to interview my friend Jax. I use she, her, key, kin pronouns, any, in either any of those. And Jax, could you introduce yourself too? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'm Jax McNamara. And I am on Tewa land called Ogapoge, or known as Santa Fe, New Mexico, colonially. And I use they, them pronouns. Yeah, and I was wondering if I could talk to you about abusers in radical spaces. I feel like abusers is not a term that's in fashion anymore. I feel like I'm supposed to say people who do harm. <laughs> Because abuser sounds like a, a label, like you slap a label on somebody and then they're unredeemable. So if I say people who do harm, then that includes all of us and it's less uh, us and them-ish. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you feel like there's a, a feeling of that, Jax? I do, yeah. I feel like the term abuser is very loaded. Yeah. 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 And do you have experience in radical spaces and orgs with, with feeling abused or being abused or that type of harm? Um, that's a great question. I don't know if I would exactly use the word abuse, mm -hmm. harm that I've experienced in radical spaces. I mean, I've definitely mm -hmm. seen abuse in radical spaces, um, but in terms of what I personally have experienced, I don't think I would go so far as to call it abuse, um, mm -hmm. but I've definitely seen a lot of harm. Most of the harm I'm thinking of has been gender-based harm, mm -hmm. you know, often perpetrated by, you know, cisgendered men um, mm -hmm. who may or may not have an awareness of power dynamics and how the way that they show up in space is impacting other people, particularly folks mm -hmm. who are not cisgendered men. Um, so yeah, I would say gender-based harm in radical spaces for sure. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for telling me a little a little bit like that. And could you talk a little bit about how you've seen it handled well and unwell? Have you seen it handled well? Because I don't I don't know if I have honestly. That's a great question. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Laura, you started to ask me that question. I was like, God, have I seen it handled well? <laughs> yeah. um, I don't feel like I have good examples to share of seeing oh. harm handled well. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, that might be a lie. No, I can think of one particular incident at kind of a large social justice organization mm -hmm. where there was harm perpetrated by the founder. Um, mm -hmm. And in this particular case, actually, the founder was a white cisgendered woman. So it wasn't gender-based harm. Um, mm -hmm it was more racially based harm. Oh. Um, and at first it was not handled well at all. There was quite a period of lots of people being harmed and things being mm -hmm. a giant mess. But eventually mm -hmm. I feel like folks got to a place of asking the person to leave the organization, you know, which is a big deal because this is the one yeah. who started, um, was one of the founders. Yeah. <clears throat> and the people who kind of took over leadership after their departure, I feel like they have done a really good job in terms of in terms of moving the organization forward, in terms of like listening mm -hmm. to people who are harmed, really mm -hmm. trying to learn from what happened in a really humble mm -hmm. way. Well, they went on kind of a big listening project for I don't mm. know like a year or something. Um, wow. and just became very, very open to feedback. Mm -hmm. And are really using that feedback to shape how the organization moves forward. So I feel like that, mm -hmm. that part of the process, I think has been really positive. Um, mm. But it was preceded by quite a long period of a lot of harm and yeah, that harm not being addressed in ways that. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you for telling me a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you see like, I feel like I see a pattern in organizations where they're often founded by someone who has charisma and, and joy and brilliance 
yet has this like part of them that's super harmful. And, and it's so many times I've seen this where like, I don't know, something about the brilliance, like it has like a little, a little gray lining to it, or it has like a component where like, it's not a coincidence that this brilliant charismatic energy is going to have like a flip side of like exploitative or like, or maybe it's like the pow where someone gets a little power and then like they go, they go to the harming side. Like it's so easy to some, or it see, it, it looks easy. And I, and I've fallen into the trap, you know, myself of like, oh, this person's awesome. I'll do such and such for them. Then, oh, I'll do that too. Oh, I'll do that too. I don't need credit. I don't, oh, okay, wait. And then I look back and a few months or years have passed and I've just given like this huge chunk of my life to, to someone else's empire when I didn't even know I was doing that and I didn't even maybe conceptualize it as an empire. But do you see patterns like that, Jax? And do you know ways that we cannot not do like that? Man, I very much see patterns like that. Yes. yes. I mean, I can think of a few concrete examples of organizations I've been involved with um, yeah. where patterns like that have been really prominent. And I think I think you're really pointing to something in terms of like the charismatic founder mm -hmm. that so kind of magnetizes and potentially exploits other people. Yeah. And usually in my experience, they don't realize that they're exploiting other people. Um, yeah. It's, you know, they're not intentionally being assholes, but, but they do end up doing that. Yes. I've seen that quite a bit. Um, yeah. And so your question was about kind of how to handle it differently. So that doesn't happen. Is that the question? Yeah. Do you have ideas of how we could do something else than that? Cause I'm, I'm pretty much done. But, but sometimes I feel like almost all the orgs I see have parts of that. If they're old enough, then they do. Like, sometimes I feel a bit hopeless. So I was just wondering if you have ideas of how to do better or if you have hope that we can do better. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think, you know, a few things that occur to me. One mm -hmm. is organizations that truly have a collective leadership model. Yeah. I think it's a lot harder for one person to consolidate power and be exploitative yeah. when there's more than one person who are generally like genuinely running the show, not just in name, yeah. but yeah. Really, really do have power. Um, I also think about, I mean, some of the exploitation that I have seen happen is very much within the framework of the nonprofit industrial complex. Yeah you know, and radical organizations that are nonprofits and are operating inside of the funding constraints and everything that comes with, you know, the nonprofit industrial complex. And yeah. so I definitely see some hope in organizations like Aorta, for example, which is, um, what does it stand for? Anti-Oppression Resource and Training Alliance, I think. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they are a worker-owned co-op. Oh, okay. Um, and they were founded as a worker-owned co-op. They didn't like convert direction but they started out and from the beginning they were like we want to have a different economic model um and we want everybody here to be a worker owner um and so they don't have the same constraints as nonprofits do um and i think some of those models are really encouraging okay great i feel i feel, still feel hopeless though Jax, because i feel like I'm just an anarchist with no money and I have no hope of having the lawyers and setting up things all legitly. So then I, I feel like what's going to happen to me is I create something beautiful and tiny. It gets bigger. It's not really healthy because it was just slapped together with bubble gum and duct tape. And then, and then we get to the point where like, oh, okay, should we become a nonprofit and, and things are already like, I don't know. Do you think it's that way? Like, do you have to have a good from the beginning? That's such a good question. I have wondered that too. Yeah. Um, I mean, <clears throat> spoiler alert, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I wish you did though. 
<laughs> I wish I did. I mean, yeah. I think it sure helps to have it be strong from the beginning. I think it's a lot yeah. harder to course correct after the fact. Yeah. yeah. Um, once sketchy dynamics have been in place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But does that mean that course correcting is not possible? No, I think that it is possible for things to change, but my experience, I mean, I've watched, I can think of a couple organizations that I've watched really significantly change from having pretty harmful structures to having much more transparent um, and healthier structures. And Mm -hmm. so it can happen. The ones that I'm thinking of that I've watched, however, go through this process, it's been pretty fucking painful. Like the transition, the transition was ugly and messy and yeah. there was a lot of hurt you know they they didn't just like easily move from one model of doing things to a healthier model of doing things there's definitely yeah very messy transitions along the way but yeah i've seen them emerge into much healthier places cool thanks for the hope sometimes i feel like cultures like baseline for emotional skills and relationship skills and self-knowledge is so low that that it's almost, yeah, sometimes I feel like giving up. Do you ever feel like that, Jax? Or are you, do you feel really damaged by it? Because I feel like it's, it's like hurt me so bad. Like I feel like, almost like I'm scared to like go into any order because I'm looking for the, okay, mm-hmm. where's the, where's, the really horrible thing that they're trying to pretend that's not here and it's kind of like a creepy way to approach life like I don't want to be but it's true like like so many orgs like like this community that my spouse and I live in it's like okay where's who's the abuser where's the what's the catch here are there bodies in the basement and and whose are they like and then I, I could maybe find a problem like okay great I found the problem I hope this is the worst one but but this this doesn't feel like this is like kind of a feels kind of pessimistic, or maybe it's just realistic. But but do you go through like this, Jax? Or how does it feel to you with orgs? Mm, that's a great question. Um, I definitely there's a part of me that is always like, where's the dysfunction? Yeah. <laughs> Where is it, and when is it going to show itself? You know, because everything yeah. seems okay right now, but there's no reason to expect it will stay that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is definitely a part of my MO as well. Mm-hmm. I really like the idea of showing up for love and doing compassion and caring about people. But yeah, sometimes I think that if I'm showing up for that and not everyone is, it's kind of like, I feel like that setting up radical mental health collectives, like I'm intentionally bringing together a bunch of vulnerable people who have this trauma and these experiences and probably a lot of bad, like psychiatric, uh, yeah, harm that's been done to us. I'm intentionally bringing all these beautiful, creative, vibrant sheep together and who, when's the wolf going to come and how good is their costume going to be? Like I have felt uh, responsible in ways that like, holy shit, I really need to, uh, yeah, have something together before, beforehand. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thanks for hearing me talk about it. I don't know what my question is there, but something like, maybe how about a question like, do you think it's real? The abuser, like the wolf sheep distinction, like, because sometimes I think it is real. There are people who are really exploitative. And then there's like regular people who just make mistakes. Like, but I feel like the fashion is to believe for all the regular people who make mistakes. Do you have any, any thoughts about that, Jax? Hmm. I do. I do. I mean, one thing that occurs to me is just that I think sometimes the distinction has to do with how much power is involved like so i'm thinking Mm -hmm. on one hand of an icarus project group we had in the bay area so you know it's like Mm -hmm. local peer-based mental health um 
And there was someone in that group who became very harmful and, but he didn't, he didn't have power. Well, other than like privilege based power, right? Like he was a white man, but, Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't have power in the group. Mm -hmm. And so he caused, you know, a good amount of harm, um, mostly, Mm -hmm. but I would say mostly unintentionally just like Mm. stupid shit to people of color and, Mm just not knowing how to like conduct himself in like a diverse Mm -hmm. community um you know talking over women and taking up too much space doing a lot of white man things taking up too much space being too loud um Mm -hmm. and and because of him doing those things you know people left the group people were like i don't want to come anymore if he's part of this group i don't want to be around yeah Yeah. Uh, i feel like that's like one tier of harm that's kind mm. of more of the pure base. Like we all make mistakes. Those particular mistakes really stink. They're really mm. related to social position and not interrogating your social position. Yeah. Out. But I feel like that's a little different than the kind of harm we were talking about earlier where there's power involved and there's like yeah. explanation. <clears throat> uh-huh. um, yeah. Hmm. Mm that's that's valuable i like that distinction that's interesting to me and it seems to me that a lot of times how that power is created and maintained can have to do with how skilled someone is at yeah the charisma piece like if that person that you mentioned had been more charismatic and had maybe more time maybe they would have do you think maybe they would have like done more bigger harms yeah, I think it's entirely possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really interesting distinction to think about it in terms of the charisma because this person was not very charismatic. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they didn't magnetize people. Yeah. I think a lot about that. Like, where does that charisma come from and where does power come from? And kind of like the power over... And then like the personal power that I see inside of me, that's more just kind of like my life force, I think. Mm. But I don't, yeah, I don't want to make really rigid distinctions if they don't belong. Yeah. But do you see that inside yourself? Like, do you, do you ever think that you could, like, have you been harmful? And do you think, like, do you, take safeguards against that or how how do you fit into it personally if you don't mind I guess that's like a really private might be a private thing but if you don't mind speaking to it like how do you do you like do things to try to make sure you don't do that in orcs that's a great question um I mean I think that the short answer is yes I have Mm -hmm. done for sure Mm -hmm. Uh, not harm of the like massively exploiting people size um but you know i'm a white person like i'm a white person who started an international movement when i was 22 years old and Mm -hmm. did not understand a lot about the power dynamics that were just inherent in me being like a class privileged educated white person in a role of leadership and power you know, mm-hmm. and um, so definitely there was some harm that I was part of in the early years of the Icarus Project. Um, mm-hmm. I think also I've done harm as kind of as a bystander who did not mm. intervene sufficiently. Mm-hmm. Like when there was harm happening around me that somebody I was close to was perpetrating and that mm-hmm. I did not adequately try to intervene and kind mm. of allow that person to continue perpetrating harm um mm-hmm. <clears throat> that is a place that i really have some regret um mm-hmm. for sure yeah. yeah um you know and i think there were i mean to use the Icarus project as an example like i think there were a mm-hmm. lot of things we did totally unconsciously in the early years of the Icarus project that didn't make it feel like the safest space for people of color Mm. Um, you know and none of those were intentional right like our intention was to like be good white people but our reality was that we had not done a lot of work on 
ourselves as white people and understanding the dynamics mm-hmm. that we're part of. Um, mm-hmm. And so we definitely modeled this whole organization in a way that felt really welcoming to other white educated people, you know, mm-hmm. and did not mm-hmm. feel so welcoming to a lot of other folks with different identities, you know, and then that was mm-hmm. work that we had to consciously change course, you know, a few years in when people started really calling our attention to it and be like, oh, okay, let's yeah. make some changes. We need to really make some changes in how this project is structured and who is in leadership and what we're centering, how mm-hmm. we're keeping safer spaces in our meetings. And like, there was a lot of learning that happened, um, mm-hmm. you know, and that ultimately resulted in, I mean, I ultimately felt like I needed to just step out of leadership so the people of mm-hmm. color could step into leadership mm-hmm. um, and the organization could go in a different direction. And that's what happened, mm-hmm. you know, which felt like the right, the right move to make. Um, mm-hmm. There were some other white people who held on to power a lot longer than I did mm-hmm. and continued to cause some harm um, and weren't quite ready to step out or step back and make space for newer generations of folks. Mm-hmm. Hard. Yeah, I feel like that's kind of a long rambly answer, but is that helpful? Yes, I love that answer, thank you. I love thinking about this stuff. This is one of my favorite topics. I think about power all day. Yeah. It's such a fascinating thing to me and it's pretty mystifying. Yet I I keep trying, I keep trying to learn learn things about it. I just got out of the little free library out front of our house, a book called Truth or Dare by Starhawk that's Mm -hmm. about power. I haven't started reading it yet. But I was wondering also, let's see. So you told me about, oh, a little bit about what happened with Icarus and safer spaces and race and how if we start orgs before we've examined some of our own privileges. Oh yeah, we were talking about how you, yeah, because I think I try to, pay attention to myself. I asked for feedback from my spouse, but my spouse loves me like crazy. So I have to ask for feedback from a lot of different people to get perspectives. And sometimes I'm afraid, oh my God, if I do this thing, is this wrong? And I, and sometimes I'm really off base. Like I think it might be wrong, but other people, it's amazing how different our ideas of wrong can be sometimes or I'll think something's totally innocuous and realize, oh crap, that was not innocuous. Like, so it's so great to get feedback from many different kinds of people. I guess compensation is always something that I think about a lot too. Like, when would we live in capitalism and in a easy way to feel like I'm not exploiting someone is to give them money it just feels like such a small a small thing money when when like actual respect I don't know it's supposed to be so common but it can feel kind of rare but hmm so I feel like I've asked you some some good things but Is there any like nugget of truth that you could give to to the readers or listeners or me about being in groups in ways that are less harmful or or maybe also like that sheep wolf situation I was mentioning like if you're intentionally assembling people who are vulnerable, how to help, how to help, or, or maybe, I'm sorry, this is getting too big, maybe, that bystander situation you mentioned, because that really interests me, because I feel like I've been the bystander, and I've been the one who has waited too long to say, like, I doubt myself, and then I'm like, did that really happen? And then it happens again, and do you have any, like, ideas about about that, like how to how to speak up faster or how to know like what you what you might have wished you would have done in something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think for me, like the bystander, the bystander piece mm -hmm. involved a fair amount of compartmentalization, mm -hmm. like pushing something out of my consciousness. Mm. Um, and I'm really good at that. I'm mm. a trauma survivor. I have deep skills in compartmentalization. <laughs> Uh -huh. um, and there are places in my life where those skills have really served me and been super useful. And like what? Like what? Oh, God. Like not getting completely bogged down by the total terribleness of our world such that I can't function. Oh, I see what you mean now. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, or like I have to compartmentalize very significantly in order to maintain relationships with certain family members. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that in the instance of harm mm -hmm. and being a bystander, that my compartmentalization, it was only serving me, but it was not serving other people. Mm -hmm. I need to not focus on what was uncomfortable and mm -hmm. be brave and deal with it. Mm hmm you know, and so if I was going to go back and talk to myself, I'd be like, Jax, you need to be brave. You need to do the uncomfortable thing. Mm. It is important. Mm. Oh, I love hearing that. I want to go back in time and tell myself that too. I feel like, like, wow, when is it a good time? Like I, like if in my life, like there's always so many things going on, kind of like when to go to the dentist. It is never a good time for me to go to the dentist. <laughs> I'll think like, oh, I'm having a break coming up. My stress will be lower. I can handle it. And then I cancel because, yeah, life is filled with so many things. Mm -hmm. But I love, and I love those examples too about the compartmentalization because, because yeah, we do have to, don't we? Like, I think I tend to like demonize it like, like, oh, I'm bad when I do that. But you're right. We have to for survival, don't we? Like mm -hmm. filter things and sort things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The other thing I would I wanted to say. Yeah. Relationship to a little earlier part of your question of just like about yeah. how to be in groups in a good way. Yeah. Like what I would do differently in groups uh -huh. is like stronger facilitation. Mm. Like, I think... There's often an impulse, especially in kind of organically forming peer-based spaces yeah. to just have a super, super horizontal structure. And mm -hmm. it actually really serves folks for there to be strong facilitation. Mm -hmm. um, if harmful dynamics start to surface, there's somebody holding the space who's going to like deal with that. Yeah. Not allow it to overwhelm the space. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, brilliant. So do you have, do you know any resources for that? Or is it just a matter of practice or? I mean, there's trainings people can take. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of practice. There's also definitely good zines, but I'm not sure what they are right now. Oh, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. I could think about it. Yeah, that makes me want to make a good zine about it. If I even could. I wonder, because sometimes I think I was never a leader. I just started because it wasn't happening and I had to make it happen. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can, do you think about leadership, Jax? Do you, do you think you're a good leader? Or can you say what might make a good one? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I think there are times that I've been a really strong leader. I've definitely been in a lot of leadership roles, um, mm -hmm. particularly as it relates to the first project, mm -hmm. but also other places in my life. Um, but I feel like I have a lot to learn. <laughs> I feel like I still mm -hmm. have a lot to learn on that front, you know, and I'm not really in any leadership roles right now, um, which is kind of a, a change for me. Uh, well, the leadership of my family, I'm a, yeah. I'm a parent. So that's, that's where I practice leadership right now. Oh, and I could use yeah. some work in that department. Yeah. But what do I think makes a good leader? Well, I think it has to go beyond just charisma. I mean, I think yeah. that a good, because I think that's how a lot of people get into leadership mm -hmm. is like 
charisma and intelligence. Um, yeah. That's how I got into leadership. Um, mm -hmm. But I think to really be a skillful leader, you have to just really be extending care and kindness to mm -hmm. all the people that mm -hmm. are part of your group. Not just the ones you're close to or your friends, but like, yeah, what's really going to serve and benefit boom, this whole group. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are the harder and less convenient decisions to make. Yeah. But I think that they're really important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like hearing about that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. it, do you, was it 10 till or is it now if you need to go, Jax? Uh, I can do 10 till. Okay, great. I was wondering a few, a couple other things. When, uh, when you're presented with like a brilliant opportunity, uh, do, do you have any thoughts about like what, like do you have a process that you go through when you're presented with a brilliant opportunity? Like do you have certain steps that you like to take or a certain like roadmap for that? Hmm. I feel like I need a little more context. <laughs> I know, what a weird question, right? Like, I don't know, like something wonderful relationship wise or like with an organization or with or with like new ideas. Do you have a process like a like a brewing process or like a prayer process or just anything like that? OK, gotcha. Um, well, so my my instinct is to be rather impulsive, like I'm an mm. area. <laughs> my, my instinct is to jump on new exciting things mm. um, but over time I have learned <laughs> to slow down and be a little <laughs> more reflective and thoughtful and so I would say that my process probably involves talking about it with other people in my life who I trust and getting their feedback on whether it sounds like it's actually a good idea um, yeah. prayer is also part of my process and I definitely turn some things over to higher power to be like, will you just show me what I'm supposed to do here? Like, am I supposed to follow this? Am I supposed to take this? Yeah. Um, I'm kind of waiting to get some guidance back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say those are the main things that occur to me. Mm -hmm. And journaling. And is, oh, journaling, yeah. Is that land there in Santa Fe, is that land very dear to you? It is, yeah, mm -hmm. very dear to me. Did you live there a long time? I moved here nine and a half years ago. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I love New Mexico. I wanna get a, I wanna get a master's degree in the history of New Mexico, but I haven't found one. Yeah. I, I've been in touch with like, yeah, some people in Albuquerque and et cetera. But that's where my peeps, my peeps come from, New Mexico, my mom's side. Yeah. They were bombed in the Trinity bomb. Oh, wow. In 1945, yeah. And then it, it still affects us. But Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. I'm sorry I was late. And I'm very sorry that when I have conflated the Icarus project with another leader who was there and was very grateful to that leader. And I'm sorry for, for not giving credit to that team of brilliant people who did that work that saved my life. Thank you so much for doing that work. Oh, you're so welcome. You're so welcome. And I look forward to seeing what comes of music. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I'll run everything by you. Thank you. All right. Bye See you next time.